George Washington was a white man. Adams and Jefferson, too. Abe Lincoln was a white man, probably. And William McKinley, the whitest of them all. Shot down by an immigrant in Buffalo. And the star fell out of heaven. I'm dreaming of a white president. Just like the ones we've always had. A real live white man who knows the score. How to handle money or start a war. Wouldn't even have to tell me what we were fighting for. He'd be the right man if he were everybody. Good morning and welcome to the New Yorker Festival. Thank you all for coming. I'm really thrilled to have you uh, this weekend. Um, I, I'm duty bound to ask you to turn off all your various devices. And those of you who are tweeting your heads off, the hashtag is TNYFest. Uh, one of the great parts of being the editor of the New Yorker is I get to choose what to do during the New Yorker Festival. And I was completely delighted to be able to select four extraordinary writers, people whom I've read for years, people whom I admire, one of whom I even worked for, David Marinus. Uh, everybody on this stage is a master of research, writing, and their craft, and we are really honored to have them here this morning. Uh, Annette Gordon-Reed is the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School the Forsheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute and a Professor of History at Harvard. Her books include The Hemingses of Monticello and American Family, which won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for History and the National Book Award for Nonfiction, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, and Andrew Johnson are among her other works. Ron Chernow won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography and the American History Book Prize for Washington, A Life, which came out in 2010. His previous books include The House of Morgan, uh, An American De Banking De Dynasty, and The Rise of Modern Finance, which won the National Book Award for Nonfiction, Titan, The Life of John D. Rockefeller, and Alexander Hamilton. Edmund Morris won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography and the National Book Award for Biography in 1980 for The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, the first installment of an amazing trilogy that includes Theodore Rex and Colonel Roosevelt. His other books include Dutch, a memoir of Ronald Reagan, and Beethoven, a, a, a short biography of Beethoven that I highly recommend. It's, it's quite an extraordinary book, The Universal Composer, a volume of his literary essays. This Living Hand will appear in October. And I think I've done this completely out of order. But uh, David Marinus, who's next to Annette, uh, <laughs> my first editor at the Washington Post, is an, still an associate editor at the Washington Post and the author of Barack Obama, The Story, which came out in June. His many previous books include First in His Class, a biography of Bill Clinton, Rome 1960, The Summer Olympics That Stirred the World, and biographies of Vince Lombardi and Roberto Clemente. And Vince Lombardi was also on Broadway as about the unlikeliest, most amusing <laughs> musical in the history of Broadway. <laughs> His work at the Post has earned two Pulitzer Prizes in 1993 and in 2008. Please welcome them. A few years ago, I had a conversation with my colleague at The New Yorker, Judith Thurman, a, a really wonderful writer and also a literary biographer. She's done biographies of Isaac Dinesen, great Danish writer out of Africa, and then she did a biography of Colette. And I said what idiot editors always say, so Judith, what's next? <laughs> and she resisted the opportunity or, or, or temptation to pull a pistol out of her Chanel bag and shoot me. <laughs> but she would said, no one's next, because biography is so hard, physically hard, mentally hard. You have to live with this subject for years and years. If you're doing a scholarly biography, if you're doing what uh, David Marinus does, it means crossing the globe and, and interviewing every last living soul who met your subject. Uh, and there's an intersection, I think, in the process of, of journalism and, and, and scholarly biography. How do you go about? choosing someone 
to spend your next eight years with. It's a little bit like a, a mental marriage, isn't it? Um, and what's the impulse to do it? Maybe we'll start with Annette. Well, the impulse for me writing about Jefferson and Monticello was, you know, something that started very, very early on. I think the subject pretty much chose me when I was in the third grade. And so Jefferson has been a continuing interest for me because he, his life intersects with so many other things that I'm interested in. The you, development you read of the something in the third grade that sparked you to Yes, exactly, exactly. So this is a long journey for me. And there, I mean, I've done a biography of Andrew Johnson, but that's, I promise you, a one-off. Um, <laughs> that's not happening again. Um, so because you hated him so much, or? He's just not very interesting. Yeah. I mean, the times that that's he lived in. That's not the in, subtitle. No, that's not, he's, just not, <laughs> he's just not, not very interesting. No, he's not very interesting, but the times that he lived in, he was a pivotal figure in the most in, one of the most interesting times in American history. So writing about him gave me an opportunity to write about that time period. But for me, Jefferson is, and the Hemingses, they, Jeff, Hemings is connected to him. They are my subject, so it's not likely... I'm not writing about anybody else. Mm -hmm. So this is my way to write about American history and the development of American history and, and race. So that's, that's why I'm there. Ron, you've, your most recent subject is somebody that's been uh, written about quite a lot, our first president, founder of the country, and so, and so on. Don't you look, go to the library and see the many hundreds of volumes, the many, the many biographies already written on Washington and throw up your hands and say, what could, do I really want to do this for the next X years? Well, th to be precise, David, there have been 900 biographies <laughs> written of George Washington. So many, many people have asked me why perpetrate number 901 <laughs> on an unsuspecting public. Well, actually, the Washington biography uh, started when I was uh, working on Alexander Hamilton. There came a moment late in the Revolutionary War where Hamilton had a feud with Washington that led to Hamilton quitting Washington's uh, staff. And Hamilton, of course, felt the need to justify this decision. And he sat down, he wrote a letter to his father-in-law, and he said, the great man and I have come to an open rupture. He shall for once at least repent of his ill humor. <laughs> can I can remember sitting there thinking, ill humor? Here he was describing this very moody, volatile, carping boss. I said, is this the the father of our country. And I think that the starting point of so many biographies is that um, the images of major historical figures uh, tend to harden into stereotypes. And these stereotypes are very often repeated from one biography to the next. The same anecdotes, the same observations are repeated. And then suddenly you feel that there are major dimensions of this personality that for one reason or another have eluded your predecessors and that hope open up a possibility of a fresh portrait. Well, Har Harold Bloom, as a literary critic, used to say that poets, consciously or unconsciously, are constantly in war with their predecessors, that they're forging a style and, and, and a thematic path that is, uh, you know, uh, Stevens dealing with Whitman in some way, uh, for example. Um, are you at war with previous biographers silently or overtly? Uh, do they ha are they in your mind as you set out to begin with an idea of why this is going to be different. Otherwise, you'd be dispirited, wouldn't you, thinking that you're going to be repetitious and... and uh... Yeah, actually, I thought, you know, to the extent that I felt that I was competing with previous biographers, it was more biographers of earlier generations. I was surprised that the standard references on Washington were still the four volumes by James T. Flexner, the seven volumes by Douglas Southwell Freeman. I'm sure all of you in the audience have read all 11 of those uh, in volumes. In fact, Ron, in order to get in today, they had to pass an exam. I was disappointed in your scores, by the way. <laughs> but, but those volumes actually uh, have become very uh, dated. They were based on an old edition of Washington's papers, um, 17,000 letters. That sounds like an enormous trove of paper. The new edition of Washington's papers, already 60 of a projected 90 plus, are based on 135,000 documents that were gathered by the new editor. So very often people say to me, how can you discover anything new? I say, we now know more about these um, founding figures mm -hmm. than their own contemporaries did. I dare say there were moments when I was writing about Washington that I felt I knew a lot of things about him that Martha didn't. <laughs> Uh, no, she didn't so. seem to know a hell of a lot. No, no. <laughs> uh, well, Edmund Morris, you, you, you faced off or came face to face as a biographer with a, with a president who I think may have read, read more books in one year 
uh, then everybody in this room sir, uh, it, it can in 10 years. Uh, an enormously literate, hyper-literate, uh, uh, hyper-energetic, kinetic president in, 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 in Teddy Roosevelt. What were you facing when you chose this subject? Why did you cleave to this subject? Um, what, were you, what were the biographical barriers or competitors uh, as such that you had to face when you're starting out in this project, knowing that it would take you, how many years did it take you to finish the trilogy on and off? I don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd known what I was facing, I think I'd have spent my life doing chemical engineering. <laughs> 130,000 documents, big deal. <laughs> <laughs> TR wrote 150,000 letters, uh. apart from 40 books. <laughs> Thomas Edison, whom I'm now flinching <laughs> against, wrote, has got 5 million documents in his archive, so you're a very lucky guy. <laughs> I, I feel reassured, Edwin. <laughs> I think that the fundamental impulse in starting biography, at least speaking for myself, is curiosity. There was something about Theodore Roosevelt in the year 1975 that sparked my curiosity. And um, specifically, it was when Richard Nixon resigned, and he quoted Theodore Roosevelt in that rather maudlin speech he gave at the White House, saying goodbye to the White House, White House staff. He began to quote a rather moving little oh. eulogy that Theodore Roosevelt had written at some point in his life, I didn't know when, but the words were moving. She was beautiful in face and form. There had never come to her any great sorrow. As a fair flower she lived, and as a fair flower she died, says Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Tears running down his face. I'm thinking, what the hell has this got to do with resigning the presidency? <laughs> and what were the circumstances in which this Theodore Roosevelt wrote those words? So I rushed down to the Donnell Library and dug out a short biography of him, and I found that the circumstances were indeed very moving. It was the loss of his um, young wife, Alice Hathaway Lee, in a house just opposite where we are right now, number 7 West 57th Street. The loss of his wife and his mother in the same house on the same night in 1884. So instantly, I realized this is a supremely dramatic event, and I wanted to find out more and more. And I began to research his life and found this guy to be compulsively interesting, and found myself willy-nilly wanting to know more and more. So curiosity led to a book, which led to another book, which led to another. And 34 years later, I ended up with the last volume of the trilogy. David. If I'd known in advance it was going to be that much, as I say, I think I would have quailed. David, you do something quite different. You're, you're writing about, when it comes to the presidents, and you've, you've done a number of books that are uh, obviously with subjects that are not alive. But when it comes to presidents, you're doing something quite different. There aren't 130,000 documents. There are potentially no documents that you have to go find everything. There's no presidential library awaiting the Clinton biographer when you wrote uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. your book. There is certainly, I can tell you, no Barack Obama library uh, awaiting you, although with one more debate like that, there might be all too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Get to that. Um, tragic as it might be. Uh, you're doing something entirely different. And your, your, your purposes and your goal is something maybe quite different because you're first out of the box, relatively speaking. There aren't oh, six walls of Jefferson biographies, um, Roosevelt biographies, Washington biographies. What are you up to? What's, what's, what, what's different about what you do? Well, first of all, I should say that I'm not at war with the previous uh, Obama biographer, some guy named David Remick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you were, I'd be dead on the floor. <laughs> no, I'm at war with some of the mythology that surrounds people. But, but in truth, uh, what I'm trying to do is not write for the moment, but write for history and set a standard for the, for the early... Uh, I mean, I know that in the case of President Obama, uh, there'll probably be like uh, Washington over the next 200 years if there are still books. 
hundreds of books about him because of his history-making uh, story. Um, but I want the first, uh, my, I want my version to be solid mm -hmm. and something that, that, you know, you can dispute different uh, 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 analyses, but that the facts are there for people to, to trust. And your and reader so, thinks you have, I'm sorry, but yeah. your reader thinks you have something that your, your fellows on this panel, do, of course, do not have because of time, which is access to the subject. But in fact... Oh, that's fa baloney. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the president, I, I think the, the reader should know that the, the, the White House now has a kind of set way of dealing with book writers that they more or less trust, which is at the end of their process, you come in and you do an interview, and it lasts a very limited amount of time. And how useful or not is that to you, David? Well, uh, in the case of Bill Clinton, it never happened. It was like Lucy and the football in the peanut strip, where every time an uh, interview would be set up, uh, Stephanopoulos would call at the last minute and pull it back, because uh, President Clinton knew that he couldn't dismiss me as a right-wing conspirator, and there were parts of his life that he didn't want to deal with while he was president. Uh, with, with President Obama, uh, it, was, it was scheduled for 45 minutes. Um, and it lasted for an hour and a half for because one specific reason. Girlfriends. I gave him a copy <laughs> of the table of contents. And chapter 17 is Jennifer in the Veil. Yeah. And I knew that his, his staff would have no clue what, what that was about and that President Obama would. And he'd want to keep talking until we got around to him finding out where Genevieve Cook was and how she was doing and <laughs> so on. So, uh, so he, he, can't, he can't do that like a normal person on Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, he can't. Uh, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. But getting back to the, the letters part of it, you're right. There's, there's no uh, re direct repository to go for their, for their material. Um, but there were places to find it. And, right. you know, when I moved to Hope Arkansas, or went to Hope, Arkansas, I was hanging out in a, the only motel on the outskirts of town. And uh, it turns out that the night desk clerk said she was Bill Clinton's great aunt. And half the people in Hope, Arkansas said they were related to Bill Clinton. The other half, the other half probably really were. Um, but she felt sorry for me because I'm an incredibly allergic, pathetic person in the spring time. And she said she had a magic potion cure for my uh, allergies, took me to her house. And while we were there, she said, oh, by the way, up in my attic, I have a box full of Bill Clinton's grandmother's, mamma's effects. And we went up there, and my heart was pounding, and I opened up the box. And there were stationery that said Georgetown University in a pile of Bill Clinton's letters. So by going to places, there, um, these are not archives, but they are archives. The, the gods of nonfiction. Yes. Yes. The gods. I mean, you had access to someone on a level of, of a, for a modern president at least, that I, you know, short of aides like Arthur Schlesinger or Theodore Sorensen, uh, I've never heard of. Uh, the, the Reagan administration invited you in at a certain point. Uh, because Reagan admired your Roosevelt, and you were there, I, I, you'll tell us in a second, an, 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 an enormous amount of time, and you were trying to do what the rest of us couldn't do, whether we admired him or the opposite, which was to penetrate somehow this person, Ronald Reagan. And you found it to be, I think, a mixed bag, I think it's fair to say, and forced you to reconceive even what you were writing. Uh, in other words, access is not always what you expect it to be. No, oh, access was more than I expected it to be. Access was crucial. Um, unlike Schlesinger and unlike Robert Sherwood, I was not a paid member of the government. I was a freelance writer who had this extraordinary deal that I could come and go to the White House completely at will, follow the president around whenever he traveled, if I wanted to, paying my own way, plus a first class plus a dollar, which means that you're not um, competing with the government. And I had uh, this, this access. I could interview the president when, more or less whenever I felt like it and have unlimited access to his family and to his documents. So um, if I hadn't had that, I would not have been able to write about him with the vividness that I think I was able to deploy. Um, the access became uh, challenging when I realized that the man himself behind the desk was aloof and mysterious and could not be described in orthodox terms. I won't go into too much detail about the way I wrote the book because um, it would take too much time, but 
If I had not been able to sit there looking at him, listening to him, feeling him, seeing him react to questions, for example, a revelatory incident was I was interviewing him one day in the Oval Office in this egg-like solitude of the Oval Office. It's not only shaped like an egg, it's golden colored, it's, and the rest of the world seems a million miles away. I'm interviewing the most powerful man in the world, and I said to him, Mr. President, when you were young in Des Moines in 1933 as a young sportscaster, what did you do in the evenings? I was trying to find out about his sex life. <laughs> <laughs> Thought he might begin to talk about girls. Um, he said, oh, I used to go to the advertising club. I said, why? He said, well, they had all the best speakers from out of town, and I learned a lot about public speaking from listening to those speakers in the advertising club in Des Moines. He said, I remember a guy who came. He made us laugh so much. He was presented to us as the president of a toilet paper company. And he gave a speech about the manufacture of toilet paper that had us all laughing fit to bust. I said, really? Um, what kind of jokes did he said? And suddenly his voice changed. His eyes glazed, and it became the voice of this Spieler in 1933 in Des Moines. He disgorged this entire humorous, or what passed for humor in 1933 in Des Moines. <laughs> and it went on for about 10 minutes. I have it on tape. I could not believe what I was hearing. He was channeling this long ago speaker. And that's when I realized one of the aspects of Ronald Reagan was he was a consummate actor who had a phonographic memory. And this kind of revelatory incident could not have occurred if I hadn't been able to have this access. Annette, you said something very interesting in the past. You, you said when it comes to African Americans in this country, well, obviously in this country, social history has trumped biography. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of group identity instead of individual, as you said, leading us to miss the complexity of black lives. Your books have sought to rectify this to treat the Hemings family members as people and not, not concepts. Has the impulse towards social history changed under a black president, or has it been aggravated in some sense? Well, it's, there's, it's still contentious because the problem of slavery is so enormous. People don't want to seem, if you, if you tell the story of an enslaved person who you know, doesn't have the normal, what people think of as the normal trajectory mm -hmm. or normal image of what slavery was about, right. are you lessening the impact of slavery? But, I mean, for me, the important thing was to try to give people a stake in the Hemings family. I, the whole notion of rejecting their story about Sally Hemings' connection to Jefferson and what that was all about at Monticello, mm -hmm. I thought, in part, grew out of this lack of knowledge about African-American people in, in individual ways, to think of them as, as having their own individual inner monologues and inner stories. And so I don't, I don't think we'll have to play it out. I don't know what having a black president has actually meant. I mean, right now, we're, we're still trying to sort this out because some people say it's, it's a post-racial America, and obviously I don't Does think Does anybody really case. say that? Yeah, people say it like, maybe they say it as a joke, but I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, there are people who think that this is, well, this is the story. We can have a black president, so all of the problems that people were perceiving before um, don't exist. If, you ha if you're having difficulties, you're pretty much on your own. It's because of your own um, flaws or whatever, and he is the person who shows you that that's not, that that's not the case anymore. It's about individual, some notion of individual merit. And whether people, I've had people say things like that, and whether they actually believe it is another story. Um, mm -hmm. But this is something that's still working itself out. And, you know, the, the charge about him in the beginning, or the, the suggestion that he wasn't African American in the way that enough. I'm an African American. Enough. You know, that not he doesn't have, enough. not black enough, he did not, not, didn't have a slave past or whatever, mm -hmm. as if somehow the notion of white supremacy that doesn't just operate in America, but certainly operate in, in the colonial experience in, in Kenya, isn't, isn't something that ties people, black people together across the globe. Well, so. I, I, I can tell you from personal experience, from, even from emails I just got this morning, that if you, if you write about Barack Obama in, in even a remotely uh, dispassionate or sympathetic way, you will get blowback from a kind of right-wing uh, machine, a reactionary machine. I don't mean conservative, but reactionary machine, Jerome Corsi, all, all these people 
uh, that, you know, it, it's a campaign, and I would have thought they already had the pro-KKK vote. Um, <laughs> you wrote about something in the past, and I wonder if you got blowback either in the scholarly world or in this kind of nether world because of the way you wrote about Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Well, the blowback... Did it ever get ugly? Did it ever get... Yeah. It got ugly. It didn't get as ugly as I thought it was going to get. I, it didn't get ugly among the scholarly community because people in the scholarly community had, I think, were open to this idea. But for some people out there who really felt that I was trying to destroy Jefferson, because people, well, there's some skepticism about me. It's what is an African American doing, person being a biographer of this 18th century white guy with the dubious racial values. Um, so I cannot be, there's this thing about black people cannot be objective, right? Can I be an objective uh, a writer about someone? So there was the skepticism there. There was one person who would describe me as the Negro historian um, to sort of signal what it meant. You know, she's writing this stuff and so therefore you know where she's coming from because she's the Negro historian and I, and I thus have a, have a, have a bias, whereas white guys who are writing about Jefferson don't have a bias mm. in some sort of way. <laughs> well, I mean, there's this tremendous identification. I mean, there were people who wrote about Jefferson who obviously had an identification with him. I suppose I have an identification with him in some ways about some things. I like to read, you know, like architecture, those kinds of things. But it's, it'd be difficult for me to imagine myself as Thomas Jefferson, as I think Rob, lots you, of people do. You, do you imagine yourself as George Washington? Very, no, never. No, I wouldn't think. <laughs> <laughs> How about but, Alexander Hamilton? But, but uh, Annette raises a, 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 an even broader theme, and that is as you face your previous biographies, that things change, attitudes in the, change in the world, attitudes, uh, racial attitudes, social attitudes, political attitudes, the way we talk about men and women and sex and private life change. And when you look at the Washington biographies, you're also looking at a, a history of mentalities, aren't you, um, when you're trying to face up. So what could you do as a Washington biographer that your predecessors seemed mentally unable to come to grips with? Well, it's interesting, because you, you would think that biography as a genre is not a genre that would change significantly from generation to generation, and yet it, it changes enormously. That even 50 years ago, uh, presidential biography in particular was uh, considered the public life of a public figure, uh, and it was considered very demeaning to the president to delve into the detail, details of uh, private life. Uh, whereas now, I think the public, quite rightly, uh, demands a full, rich, rounded portrait of both the public life and the and the private life. At its worst, this can veer into uh, you know a, a tabloid, you know, voyeuristic look at the uh, at the president. But I think that it's produced an unusually rich uh, crop of uh, presidential uh, biographies. And it's interesting, just apropos of the subject of slavery, I know that uh, some people read my uh, Washington book and felt that I had overemphasized slavery and that I was guilty of what historians call presentism, that is projecting contemporary values mm -hmm. into the past. Whereas I felt very strongly what had happened uh, was that the slavery issue, and was it true with uh, uh, Jefferson, and that the slavery issue had been edited out of the story, and that essentially what we were doing was restoring right. history that had been airbrushed from the, uh, the record, so that I was able, again, through the small cash of $135,000 <laughs> <laughs> that I had access to, that very limited <laughs> trove of uh, papers, yeah, um, now, I was able to, I think, recreate Washington as a slave master much more Fully than it's, before. It's, it's also how we look at personality, isn't it? We have modern, we have post-Freudian views of how we look at post-post-Freudian views of the way we look at, 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 at personality. Earlier this year, you described George Washington to the Wall Street Journal as inauthentic, saying that now we admire people for their authenticity in terms of how quickly they open up and bear their emotions, but that our national patriarch, Washington, had an old-fashioned belief that silence was strength and that you only very gradually let people enter your private thoughts and emotions, whereas we're all very anxious about Barack Obama doing precisely the Washington Washingtonian thing, being dispassionate, yeah. not showing up, uh, being a kind of uh, a, um, a bear for dignity as opposed to letting one's feelings show. 
Um, it's, it, it, that it's very bears on the you know, I, I, I confess I, I, I watched a lot of the Republican National Convention, which I know is a very masochistic <laughs> thing for me to have done. But they were interviewing uh, w one of the um, uh, uh, pundits who said that the major uh, objective of the convention was to present um, Mitt Romney as a human being. And I thought to myself, boy, that's setting the bar very, very low <laughs> <laughs> to prove that he's right. a human being. But this has become very, very um, uh, central that we want our presidents to be emotionally accept accessible. You can't imagine Martha coming out on stage and talking about how much she loves her husband. And no, but I've, no. I've thought a lot about you know, why this, this change has taken place. I mean, it's partly that we live in a, a psychotherapeutic <clears throat> age, and so we're looking for politicians who have this kind of you know, confessional uh, urge. But I think also what happened, if you go back to the early years of the Republic, when there was very much a Federalist ideal that the country was going to be run by um, an elite group of highly educated you know, men of, of property who would govern on behalf of the rest of the, uh, of, of the country. And it, it allowed Washington to have this very kind of you know, lofty patrician uh, aura. What happened starting with Jefferson, then it very much accelerates uh, under Andrew Jackson, is the notion uh, that the president emerges from the common people. The president becomes the representative, the embodiment of the, uh, the common people. So that, um, that everybody is identified. You have to come from a log cabin in some form or Well, day. this became a staple yeah. of campaign right. literature in the 18th uh, century. In fact, um, Lincoln, by the time Lincoln became president, he was actually a highly successful um, lawyer who had represented a powerful, uh, a, a lot of powerful railroads, and yet the Republican convention that year, they brought these rails that he had allegedly split to show that he had emerged from the, the common people. And this is a very central part of the whole mystique of the American presidency, that the president emerges from the people so that we have, on the one hand, a particular kind of purchase and access to them, and they have to, in turn, open themselves up. I mean, this whole business, um, who, whom would you like to have a beer with? I mean, that's obviously not a question that would have come up regularly in the days of uh, Washington no. and, uh, and, no. and, and Jefferson. Less, but, yeah. but it's become a staple of American political law, and it says I, something about the way we I, I think Annette wanted to jump in. No, I was just on this, this notion of, of the public and the private. I just remembered a, a letter that someone wrote to Jefferson when, after he was in retirement saying that they wanted to write a biography of him. And he, um, he agreed that this was a good idea, and the, the guy wrote him again and asked him the names of his grandchildren, his children and grandchildren. He wrote back and said, why on earth do you want to know the names of my children and grandchildren that, you know, I don't want to bore the public with things like that. Right. It's basically, and he talks about it, a biography is about the public man, you know, the public person, the thing that a person has done in, in public life, not about what goes on in his private life. Now, obviously, there are reasons why he would not want people to, to go there, but, um, <laughs> but that was his idea, that public life is, he's a public statesman, and that's what you're going to write about. And so he, when he compiles all of his letters, um, and farm book and all those things. He does them in order and the way that he wants them to be presented to history uh, and for historians to write his story. And he's very, very cagey in letters and, and you know, with that idea that this is, this is me as a public, uh, public statesman. Edmund and David, um, I, I confess that I, I read biographies more sparingly than other genres because I find very often biographies are as writing a mess. They're like big, giant shopping bags into which loads of groceries go in a kind of undifferentiated, I'm now losing the track of my metaphor, but you understand what I mean. They become what Henry James used to call big baggy monsters, uh, although I think Henry James's definition was a finer one. You open a book and with one of the, one of the great set pieces uh, of the first day, I think it's the first day in office when, when Roosevelt has peop ordinary people stream through the White House, and through this mechanism, uh, which is extraordinarily moving and vivid and, as we say in modern terms, cinematic, a lot of information is conveyed. A lot of freight is being uh, hauled. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's one of many such set pieces in, in, this, uh, in this series on, on Roosevelt. You, I think, I think everybody here uh, on this stage sees biography as at least potentially a great literary form 
that's not always fulfilled by others. Um, as a writer, as, and as somebody who's accumulating enormous amounts of information and paper and knowing too much, a lot of the process is one of leaving out. It's a process of novelistic uh, writing into the truth. How, try to give people here a sense of the decisions that you're making as a writer uh, to get the book going. Yes, well, I do, passion it. I do passionately believe that biography is a form of literature and that it can be raised to the level of art. Um, did you have it, models for that when you started doing this? Did I what? Did you have models for that, biographers, previous biographers that were... Well, um, the models I would have would just simply be the great novels that I'd read when I was younger, and they still remain models to me because the novel used to be in Scott Fitzgerald's formulation, action, uh, character perceived in action. Uh, novels used to be about compulsively interesting people who progressed through a series of adventures and arrived at a resolution of sorts. And that really is the formula of, of, of a biography, indistinguishable from that of a narrative novel. In each of the cases that I've written about, I found uh, a personality whom I considered to be uh, um, extremely interesting and varied with all the qualities that I find literarily inspiring. And these men lived great adventurous lives, which I was able to narrate in action. And that was the literary appeal of these subjects. I had no desire to write these about two presidents, Theodore Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan, for any doctrinal or ideological reasons. I'm not very interested in political ideology. It was just that they were extremely fascinating people who lived many lives and produced many things and in the process transformed the world they lived in. So I feel that biography legitimately should use all the devices of literature that are available with the exception of uh, imaginative reconstruction of fact. Even though Dutch was, my biography of Ronald Reagan was, um, vituperatively criticized by many in its time as inventing facts. I actually never invented a single fact about Ronald Reagan's life. However, when I told the story, for example, of his, um, the first movie he made in 1937, in a dreamlike narrative fashion where scene by scene the movie, as he, mo as he, produced, as he went through the production, the scene by scene impinged upon him in no kind of logical sequence, because that's how movies are put together. Uh, <clears throat> I was criticized for inventing his stream of consciousness. Actually, every word of it came from Reagan's own written account in the Des Moines Dispatch in 1937. Mm -hmm. So I used literary techniques to describe the production of this movie, but the basis was fact. I think that the techniques of dialogue and theatrical exits and entrances um, all these devices, which were freely used by great biographers like James Boswell, uh, the techniques of the cinema, uh, spotlights, um, montages, dissolves, all these mm -hmm. are legitimate in biography, providing the scholarship is impeccable and the facts are true. David, your background is, is uh, from newspaper journalism, and then you started writing books, and but you're obviously a, 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 a voracious reader of fiction as well. How, how do you see this, this, these formal questions, uh, whether it's in Clinton or, or Obama or in your other books? How do you, how do you go at it? Well, first of all, I, I sort of base it on three things. One, I have to be obsessed with the subject. Um, secondly, I have to see uh, some larger themes that can thread through the story of the person that I'm writing about. Um, so if it's... Uh, when I wrote the biography of Vince Lombardi, people would say, well, why don't you write about Woody Hayes next? Or, or thinking I'm going to write about Brett Favre, the quarterback. Right. But, of course, it had nothing to do with that. It was uh, <laughs> Lombardi as a way to write about the mythology of competition and success in American life. But then the third part is there has to be a dramatic arc to the story. And that's where, where I, if I don't see that, I'm not going to write, I'm not going to write that book. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's with those three elements that I, that I launch into to any of my books. Uh, and so with, with Obama, uh, for instance, 
what drew me, the obsession that drew me was not politics, really. It was two things. It was um, the incredible randomness of his life, how he was created, mm -hmm. and an opportunity to use uh, the, the story of his family to write about so many elements of the modern world. And the second was, given the contradictions which he was born to, uh, in terms of race and family and everything, how did he figure it out? How did he, how did he recreate himself? Those are the two obsessions. Well, one of the ways he created himself uh, is that he wrote a book in his pre-political life, in his pre-lapsarian yes. life. He wrote a, a, a memoir, an ambitious young man's memoir, who had thoughts of himself as a politician, whether running for mayor in Chicago or is something. He had something clearly in mind. But it was before he was capable of writing a boring, yes. defensive <laughs> campaign track, the likes of which we see every four years coming from every presidential camp campaign. Which is the second book, essentially. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Ex exactly. So the first book is, this, is, is in this tradition of African, very self-consciously of African-American memoir, which has a huge, long, rich history. Yes. And one of your projects in, in your book is to, as we say in the business, report it out. So you've got this text, and then you go back, and you go to every place he's been. And it's, it's his memoir lasts until his marriage. It's, it's like a Greek play. It's like a comedy. Greek <laughs> comedy ends with a marriage. Um, what did you find out about that text? Well, first of all, uh, you know, there's this tendency in, in the modern journalistic world right now where everything is fact-checked, which I think diminishes the whole notion. I mean, everything should be based on fact. But so my goal was not to fact check Obama's right. memoir. It was to try to find the real story. No, I'm not suggesting it was a gotcha no, 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 thing. I, I, I just know. want to see what the yes. contrast is. So, uh, so first of all, um, throughout the process, uh, I, I mean, of course, I read his memoir very deeply and, and used that, uh, you know, as a backdrop for what I was reporting. And in and in his introduction. Uh, Barack Obama writes that uh, uh, he used uh, composite characters at times and compressed uh, uh, stories. So, uh, you know, I, I knew that going in. Um, uh, and, but what I found was that, that he, he, was, he was doing that a little more than, than he would let on, uh, and he was doing it for specific reasons, uh, that his book was meant entirely in the first uh, proposal which I got, shows that it was supposed to be just a look at at his, the issues of his life through the lens of race. Right. And so what he did was he would enhance characters who uh, were African American who could serve the purpose of, of telling a very legitimate story, uh, theme that he wanted to advance and, and eliminate or diminish other characters who were more essential really in the story of his life. Um, I understand that. My goal is not to say you know, that I got him on it, but to explain the context of what he did and the reality of what I found. Mm -hmm. uh, when I interviewed him in the White House, uh, I let him read the introduction to my book where I discuss all this. And he, he's his first, you know, after we're talking about the Packers and the Bears, uh, he said, you know, David, I read your introduction. It's really interesting, well-written, but you call my book fiction. And I said, no, Mr. President, actually I complimented you. I called it literature. Uh, right. But we went through all of those cases. And in fact, uh, it's a combination of purposeful uh, manipulation of the story on his part to advance a theme mm -hmm. and innocent mythology that he was passed along by his parents. You know, there's so many examples in his book um, where, for instance, he says that his step-grandfather, the Indonesian of, uh, of his, his mother married Lolo Satoro, he, the Lolo Satoro's father, he says in, in his memoir, was, was killed as a martyr fighting the Dutch in the revolution. Right. And in fact, when I went to Indonesia and got the documents, Not he so. died falling off an ottoman, uh, changing the drapes in his living room. You know? <laughs> but think which, about it. Anybody which is, in which this is audience, less literary and dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> but all of us here on stage and in the audience know that we've been told stories by our parents and grandparents and uncles and everybody yeah. that if we had an historian going back and checking them out, we'd find so many examples yeah. of that. Story. My it's uncle very, died from sitting natural, too close to the natural. television. I'm yes. sorry? It's, it's a very natural human instinct. It's, it's, yes. it's universal to reconstruct the past, to edit, to combine when necessary for narrative purposes. It's not dishonest. It's, it's human nature. And as biographers, we not only have to deal with this, but we have to acknowledge the fact that all the documents we base our supposedly factual accounts on are themselves a superior form of fiction. Mm. A letter, for example, 
I, I've, I've been reading a, a letter of Thomas Edison's the other day to Henry Ford, his bosom buddy, about the evils of tobacco smoking and how tobacco has this particular ingredient that acts on the human brain in an addictive fashion and is it, it, I will allow no smoking in my factories for, because of its psychological effect. Meanwhile, Edison spent his whole life smoking cigars. The letter would <laughs> seem to be a statement of his disapproval of nicotine, but actually he wrote it because he knew Henry Ford was on this campaign to stop smoking. So he wrote Henry Ford the kind of letter Henry Ford wanted to receive. Oh, Jefferson did that all, the time. all the documents we read <laughs> uh, are written for a specific recipient, and they are directed psychologically towards this person or that. So we and, have and that you said I, I said Jefferson did that all the time. I mean, you have to know to whom he's writing, and you find out who, that person's story, and you understand why he's saying these particular things. And it drives, and I think it, particularly the founders, we have a particular problem, maybe not even so much with TR and, uh, and, and Clinton or Obama, is that they are put up on a pedestal. And when I remember uh, Joanne Freeman saying the first time you find out that you know, one of them tells a lie, you're like, that was a lie. I know it's a lie uh, because I heard what they said in the other thing. So when you have these people who revere in a particular way, and this what happens with Jefferson quite a bit, people will read, read something that he wrote and it's like a holy writ and then you find a contradiction and then yeah. people get angry. So he goes from being, you know, Jefferson the God to Jefferson the Devil because... Yeah. Well, it's the not. opposite with Clinton and Obama where they assume that they're lying. You know, the, no. the, 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 <laughs> 30% of the public assumes that they're lying. Yeah, and so yeah. what I have to deal with is the other mythology, yeah. you know, the negative mythology. Mm -hmm. Ron? You know, I mean, you know, the, uh, I, I think that uh, all of us who are in this business are struck by the uh, persistence of uh, mythology. The public clings to fairy tales, I think, because the public like simplicities, and uh, George Washington spent an enormous amount of time, you know, lovingly preserving the documentary record of his career. In fact, during the Revolutionary War, when he's bitterly complaining about a shortage of manpower and money, he goes to the Continental Congress, and he gets a special appropriation in the middle of the Revolutionary War for seven clerks to do nothing for two years, but to produce 28 beautiful ledgers full of his wartime correspondence, which he thought was his <laughs> legacy. Okay, he dies in December 1799. Uh, within months, a man named Parson Mason Locke Weems, who was both an itinerant preacher and book peddler, obviously with an eye on main chance, rushes out a biography of Washington that is full of fabrications. The cherry tree story is there, a cherry tree story, which is terrorized generations of American <laughs> school children is there for two centuries. I and all my predecessors have tried to get rid of it. We can't. Um, he also has the uh, story, again, pure fabrication, <coughs> about Washington, <coughs> excuse me, at Washington at Valley Forge, dropping to his knees in the snow and praying something that the evangelical right has used to try to prove that Washington wanted to found a Christian nation. I and all my predecessors for two centuries have tried to refute this. You're we, not going to get we, rid of we, that. We, we, we can't. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and it's, it's very interesting. Um, probably you'll know the famous line in uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, the John Ford movie, if the, fact, the facts clash with the legend, go with the legend. And boy, the public wants to go with the legend. And it's very humbling, very sobering for anyone who tries to do the impeccable scholarship and scrupulous uh, factual treatment that had been referred to. I had a metaphorical tree to deal with in my biography. And this is a true story. After Reagan was elected president, mm -hmm. he moved to a farm in Middleburg, Virginia, he and his um, transition team, uh, belonging to some rich Texan, former Governor Clements, I think. So the first day that the president-elect um, had installed himself, the first morning, his aides woke up early to the sound of chopping outside. And they looked through the window, and there's Reagan. This is like 6.30 in the morning, chopping down a gigantic, beautiful tree in the governor's plantation at the bottom of his lawn. And they rushed out and said, Mr. President, what are you doing to the tree? He said, it spoils the view. <laughs> <laughs> now that instant showed to me, here is a man who, with absolute sense of personal rightness, wanted to rearrange the view, just as he did his own ranch in, um, in Santa Barbara. 
he felt that the tree got in the way of the blue mountains in the distance. The tree had to be eliminated. This was an executive personality <laughs> yeah. with absolutely no sense of uh, being challenged by anybody, removing something that disturbed him. Well, this, this brings us to a question that I've always thought about every, every time it comes to American presidents. Do you have to be a little bit crazy to be? <laughs> you are proposing yourself to be the leader of a vast country, perhaps the most powerful one on earth. Um, without getting too ridiculous about it, when you think of these personalities, um, it seems, it's, it's certainly in, in, in modern times, and maybe with the exception of the guy now who does not seem to have this quality, Nixon, Johnson, the unknowability of Reagan, all, all of this, there's something very mysterious, and call it crazy, about all of them, each in their own way, that's um, sometimes disturbing. Ron. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting that all these people who become presidents spend uh, a lifetime uh, you know, scheming and angling to become president, and then they all end up saying the same thing, that their last day in office was the happiest day of their lives. <laughs> Um, I think that you have to have the rind of a, a rhinoceros to be a president. Even Washington, you know, when Washington became a president, there was a honeymoon period for about a year or two where he was largely exempt from criticism. He was already called the founder of the country. But then suddenly, as things became nasty and partisan, and Annette mentioned that, you know, we have this idealized view of the founding era that it was courtly and genteel. It was viciously partisan, probably much more so. Uh, than it was today. And uh, Washington, the father of the country, he's accused first of uh, aping the manners of royalty. Then he's accused of plotting to restore the British monarchy in America. Then he's actually accused of having been a British double agent throughout the Revolutionary War. <laughs> that was true. The British certainly got a bad return on their investment. <laughs> um, but it's amazing that uh, every president, uh, at some point in the presidency, if not often, says that he was the most vilified president in American history. They all have that uh, feeling. But this has accelerated. The technology of vilification has accelerated. Yeah. Um, there yeah. was no, there's no internet, there's no cable television, there's no, no, no. There's, it's, it's quite, quite different, isn't it? And it's all impinging on, we, we know that uh, Barack Obama, for example, is not immune from the habit of late at night going online and surfing on the net. And what he must see there uh, would alarm anyone. Uh, I don't see how, uh, the flip side of my question, I don't see how somebody in that office retains a, an, a grain of self-possession or sanity. Yeah. To do that, yeah, I, I don't. I think well, the times are very different. Of course, the big innovation we have in the 1790s is print, yeah. with the the printers, newspapers. By the way, we still have it. We, well, okay. <laughs> 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 I want you to know that. <laughs> yes, we still have it. We still have it. But I mean, Jefferson clearly. I mean, I mean, obviously, he didn't grow up thinking he wanted to be president because there was no such thing. But he definitely saw himself from the beginning as a leader mm. and somebody who was destined to to influence his community, even though, you know, as, a, um, as members of the House of Burgesses, as, you know, the Continental Congress and those kinds of things. So, yeah. but I can't imagine him in this day, of a, day and age doing anything like being president. I mean, he was far more, far too uh, thin-skinned for that. But even in the time when there was, he was vilified in the press, there was this strong sense that he had the best idea uh, about, you know, the way the country's supposed to go. David. Going back to the question of whether someone who runs for president has to be nuts, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm fascinated by the comparisons of Clinton and Obama in that sense. I mean, Bill Clinton really did want to be president from virtually the day he was born. And when he was in high school, he ran for every, pub, every office he could in, at Hot Springs High School until when he was a senior, his, the principal, Johnny May Mackey, came to him and said, Billy, we're sick of you. You can't run anymore. <laughs> So, uh, you can't run for class president. So he said, okay, I'll run for class secretary, which in that era, you know, the sexism was supposed to be for a girl. So he ran against his girlfriend. Maybe he should run for mayor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> his girlfriend beat him, and he wouldn't talk to her for weeks. And then, he, <laughs> and then he got to Georgetown. He ran for every, you know, freshman class president, sophomore class president, ran for senior class president. And again, his peers were sick of him and defeated him. Uh, but Clinton has always won for president, and he will for the rest of his life. Uh, Barack Obama, as you know, I mean, is so different. I mean, and he showed no political inclinations in high school. He basically played basketball and smoked dope, and that was 
pretty much it. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a bad student, but he wasn't applying himself. I should, I should say of the many things David Marinus scooped his, his um, uh, predecessors on, of which I am one, the exact method of, what was the, of smoking dope in Total a Total absorption, TA. I, I, I think that may have been invented at my high school, but the Hawaiian <laughs> version. Quite the opposite of Clinton's method. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, no. No. Clinton, Clinton says he didn't inhale, but he inhaled hashish brownies. But, uh, <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, you, you, we, we're talking about novelists being uh, the real predecessor for the way you look at biography in a certain way. But what is the modesty of the biographer as opposed to the novelist? In other words, you're dealing in fact. You're dealing in the knowable. Where do you think the limits are? What's the difference between what George Eliot can know about um, his characters and what you can know about Teddy Roosevelt? Or, or is, it, can you know the depths of someone's interior life in the same way as a biographer? No, all, all biographical subjects are at heart mysterious. Um, I've spent on and off 34 years approximately writing about TR. I spent 14 years writing about Reagan. And um, part of the literary challenge was to communicate the fact that all human beings are fundamentally unknowable. When they rise to great heights and dominate the, the affairs of the world, this, this mystery becomes increasingly interesting. Charles de Gaulle once said, il faut cultiver le mystère. It is necessary to cultivate mystery in order to lead. Um, if we have the modesty to acknowledge that we can never really figure anybody out, mm -hmm. that our conclusions can only be um, deductive, that the evidence we deal with is essentially fictional, then uh, our biographies will be received as, what is the, as what can they I are. Can I pause on that? Mm -hmm. That the evidence is essentially fictional. Yes. What does that mean? Because as I tried to indicate earlier, all documents, the, the fundamental building blocks of biographies are themselves suspect. A diary. A diary, to whom is a diary addressed? Theodore Roosevelt kept um, a detailed daily diary of his years at Harvard. Intensely interesting books, page by page detailing his love for Alice Hathaway Lee and all his student activities. But these pages were being addressed to some reader. And I realized who that reader was when I was tracing his love affair with this gorgeous girl, with um, avid, vicarious interest. Um, courting Alice Lee, he pursues her, he finally wins her, and on his graduation day, he marries her. And they spend their honeymoon night in Springfield, Massachusetts, in this hotel. So I'm turning over the page to find what it was like in bed with Alice. <laughs> and he writes, our intense happiness is too sacred to be written about. Uh -huh. And I felt myself being addressed. He was so conscious Back of off. his future eminence, <laughs> he was saying, Mr. Beady-eyed biographer, <laughs> this is private. <laughs> Documents, diaries, letters, Books, they all have this human imaginative element, and we have to take that into account <laughs> Ron, when we pretend. Except maybe. But just, I just want to. Uh, yeah. but, but, but Edmund, you did tell this very interesting story about uh, Henry Ford and Edison about the cigarette smoking, and you were able to challenge what Ford was saying versus the verifiable fact that uh, he was smoking all of these cigars himself. Mm. Uh, you know, so that you can. You, you're not accepting at face value what people are asserting, and sometimes you can. Uh, contrast that with facts that uh, can be um, uh, verified. But I essentially agree with what Edmund is saying, is that people are mysterious. After all, you know, um, how much do we know about ourselves? Very often when I talk to writing students, I say, you know, think of a quarrel that you recently uh, had with a group of people and imagine, you know, 100 to 200 years later, only one of you has left a record of that quarrel, you know, and how accurate uh, would it uh, be? very, very difficult to reconstruct history. And one of the frustrating things is um, that, you know, I've been lucky that the people that I've written about generally have left uh, voluminous records, but you find that people um, are extremely chatty about some things and then completely clam up about others. I wrote about Alexander Hamilton 
um, who must have, you know, in the crib been chattering away already, probably the most <laughs> verbal person who ever lived. And yet uh, the entire first third of his life was uh, spent in the Caribbean. And there are no more uh, than one or two sentences about the Caribbean in the 31 plus volumes uh, of his papers. George Washington's uh, father died when uh, George was 11. We have exactly one sentence uh, about his father. Uh, his mother actually lived into her 80s, into the first term of his uh, presidency, and it was a very stormy, a very kind of pathological uh, relationship. But um, we don't, um, and we have very frosty exchanges of letters um, uh, between them, but we don't actually have Washington down on the couch where someone is is asking him to. Would you have liked to have uh, Washington on the couch? Would, yeah. what, what, what would you have asked? What would you, if you, got, a challenge. Well, if can, you got your hour? Well, you know, it was 50 minutes. Because um, uh, when he was painted by uh, Gilbert Stuart, those paintings, which became the iconic pictures of Washington, those were done during, late in Washington's uh, second term. And uh, Gilbert Stuart was a master uh, portrait uh, artist uh, with very deep psychological. Uh, penetration. And one of his techniques as a portrait artist was that he would come in and he would immediately start talking about himself and telling a lot of anecdotes and he would try to slip behind the psychological defenses of his uh, subject. So Washington, you know, sweeps in very majestically into this uh, session. And the first thing that uh, Gilbert Stewart says to him is, um, General Washington, why don't we start out by pretending that uh, you're not General Washington and that I'm not uh, Stuart, the portrait painter. And Washington, without missing a beat, said, why don't we start out by not pretending that I'm not Stuart <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and uh, Gilbert Stuart luckily was perceptive enough that he saw, and this was very important for me in terms of doing the portrait, he saw that there was another Washington hiding behind the facade that he projected to the world. In fact, he made the rather extraordinary uh, statement that uh, had Washington been born in the forest, he would have been among the um, most savage, among the fiercest of the savage tribes, which was quite a powerful statement. So I don't think, I, David, I would, have, I would have had zero luck with, with Washington. I would have been tearing my hair out at the end of the analytic hour. And that, do you think you would have had any luck in pre presenting Thomas Jefferson with the central um, secret of his life? Uh, Oh, talking to him about it, asking yeah. me about it? Yeah. I, I wouldn't ask directly, um, certainly. I, how could I you help it? How could, not because, that this is going to happen. Not that this is going to happen. This is the safety of talking about yep. it. Because I think it wouldn't be my style to do it. I would ask him questions that would elicit the, um, the answer. Um, I would ask him, the fascinating thing to me would ask him, he, he had this notion, as many people did, the sort of liberal position was to emancipate slaves and send them someplace else. I would ask him, are you sending the children of white men back to Africa? Mm -hmm. You think would you would have gone for it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it wouldn't have just involved him. It would have involved his father-in-law, many, many other people in Virginia. It's a very, very, I mean, the DNA testing that they're doing on African-American males and, you know, populations in the South so showed that something like 45% of them have European Y male chromosomes. Um, this is a, something that was ubiquitous. And for him and other, the cohort, to talk about emancipation and expatriation when slavery was not just, you know, a, an economic system, it was a system that made blended families, that's what I would really like right. to hear. Because that, that is not just about him, but it's about his vision of America and his understanding of what, you know, what the country was supposed to be about. David, you, you've just spent a, a long time living inside a past that you certainly now know better than Barack Obama. I, I, I don't think he, <laughs> well, I mean this, especially the more distant past. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know much more about his grandfather and, and any number of characters, of, uh, in, or in, at least in a different way right. than, than Obama does. And you've thought deeply about how this does or does not affect him. And when you see an event, as we all did, like Wednesday night, um, and you're, you're watching it critically, you're watching it as a citizen, you're watching it as a journalist, and his performance, I think we can agree, was not his greatest night. Can you bring any deeper insight into what you're watching than the rest of us? In other words, what does biography and the that, biographer's immersion give you, and what is it not? 
that requires me to sound presumptuous. But, but, um, That's why we have panels. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, in terms of his family history, in that particular instance, probably not. But in terms of his history, yes. Uh, I think there were several elements uh, of Barack, the Barack Obama I know which help explain that particular performance. And, and I, I actually predicted it beforehand that, well, first of all, one is purely pragmatic that doesn't have to do with his personality, which is that his campaign was playing defensive already. I mean, they figured that the campaign, that the race was theirs to, to lose. lose at that point, and so don't make any mistakes. So that was the mentality. But in terms of President Obama, I mean, he has a tendency to be a little overconfident. He has a tendency to not want to confront, which goes all the way back through his childhood. I don't, I don't. For example. Well, uh, I think that as a, as a biracial or multiracial kid, he learned how to negotiate different worlds in, in, in subtle ways. And that often required not being confrontational. There's, there's an other element which is true in general and not true of Barack Obama, which is that the notion uh, of whether a, a black man can portray himself as being angry and confrontational in this ra racist society. Uh, Barack Obama happened to be that same non-confrontational way when he was a community organizer on the south side of Chicago when 98% of the people he was dealing with were African American. Right. So I think that's part of his natural personality. And as a law student, we know that he and became it, Harvard he, Law Review president. Very much so, so by negotiating these very different right. worlds. So that's, that's his tendency. Um, and, but he also has what I would say a propensity to learn from his past mistakes. So he went into this one with a predictable not, not being too, uh, also being sort of polite with Jim Lehrer and not... not uh, so you think next time he's going to be all up in Romney's grill and... <laughs> I think he'll be much more so, yeah. yes. Uh, right. Because he doesn't repeat the, those same... Uh, especially, you know, he has this contradictory nature at, at his core, which is he's ambivalent... Uh, and ironic about politics, but incredibly competitive and wants to win, right? So that's always at play, you know? And even in a debate, he's looking at it almost in a surreal sense of, I have to go through this. It's, you know, it's really pretty stupid. I don't really want to do it. And you can see that. You know, he doesn't have that natural transactional ability that Bill Clinton had. Clinton, I call an authentic phony. He could be right there at any moment. <laughs> Um, even if he wasn't, you know, and, and Obama's more removed than that. So you can s almost see his mind sort of dealing on these different levels, and that doesn't help him in situations like that. We this. swore to give some time to questions from the audience, and I think there are people racing around with microphones. Uh, I hate to make the transition so quickly, but uh, that's, what we've, what, that's what we can do. If there are hands up, right here, and then right there. Just shout it out, and I'll repeat it. We were all talking think, about that. Can yeah. everybody hear that? The, the question no. is really, are current, are, are the current president and, I guess, modern presidents, probably in light of email, in light of we are not the, the hyper-literate Teddy Roosevelt types uh, of, of the yeah. past, um, is there going to be a sufficiency of documentation in order to write uh, as it, you know, what, what these panelists have, have so remarkably done in their own lives as writers? You, Annette, you want to start? Well, I think Jefferson had a particular kind of record. I mean, not only did he write, you know, 18,000 letters, he kept a farm book, he kept a memorandum book, he wrote down every single transaction that he ever had every day. Like if he went and bought a cup of coffee, you know, I went and bought a cup of coffee. Every day from the time he was in his 20s till he's 80. So it was like so, Twitter for him. So it's like Twitter. He's Twittering, and he's <laughs> tweeting to himself, essentially. So all of the transactions are there. They're, it's, you know, a couple of thousand pages worth of things from your 20s to your, right. uh, to your 80s. So it's a, and he, this, he's an 18th century man measuring the temperature, measuring wind, he, wind charts, draws, you know, pictures of the strength of the wind every day, all that kind of stuff. Uh, nobody's so, so going to do this anymore. 18th century equivalent of breakfast excellent. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you have all those things. I don't think you're going to have huh. people doing 
combining the, the literary thing and the sort of scientific notion that, that he thought he was involved in. I mean, it's sort of crazy, but you can get, now look back and get a meteorological view of Charlottesville over a long stretch of time that he was doing. So I, I think that's different. Um, David, there's no doing. question that the first thing Barack Obama is going to do as an ex-president, let it be five years from now, yeah. is, is, is be a writer, first and foremost. I mean, that's going to be the hottest book in publishing, the bidding right. on, on, a, on, a, on a presidential memoir. And so, but it's very dangerous, isn't it, for people in the White House uh, I remember Josh Steiner in the Clinton administration dared to keep a diary, yeah. and the oh, next yeah. thing you know, it was subpoenaed. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. No, there are two elements here. One is in the White House, you're right, and that probably goes back to the Nixon tapes in some right. ways, and then through LBJ, and, and then all the subpoenas that came through the Clinton administration onward, where um, you're right. I, I, I don't know whether, whether Barack Obama is keeping a diary. What Bill Clinton did to get around it although it didn't really work out, was invite the great Taylor Branch uh, to come to the White House, you know, twice a month, and they would do interviews. And, and then he kind of screwed Taylor and, Branch. Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that didn't quite work, either right. because Bill Clinton is not a writer and really didn't want to tell the real story, uh, I don't think. Uh, you know, when, when he was actually writing his post-presidency uh, biography, uh, his biographers were carrying around my biography, but they had to put it in a fake cover so that Clinton couldn't see it. Um, be, because they just wanted to get it done, and he wasn't helping them get his story. And it's also um, a book that in the first half is kind of an interesting elaboration of your book, and then the second half is a gigantic desk diary. The presidency totally. just is completely right, absent. He, he ostensibly was using Taylor Branch to help, but it's, it's not there. The, um, but in terms of, uh, so, I think that, uh, you know, and, and then pre-presidential materials are going to be utterly different, as we were talking about before, yeah. uh, in terms of whether there will be letters or not. I think maybe Obama's the last generation where there will be. Right. Yeah. Edmund. You know, at the time of Iran-Contra, I was thinking about the consequences of being in, in the administration at a time of great tension. Uh, Arthur Lyman, who was investigating the Iran-Contra scandal um, on, in behalf of the Senate, um, actually took me aside and said, listen, I, wa I want to ask you what kind of records are you keeping about these meetings with the Reagan? Oh. I said, well, I'm keeping records for my book, obviously. He says, um, well, we want to see them. And I said, no, they're mine. He said, well, actually, Edmund, I could subpoena them within the next five seconds. So I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, I'm not going to do it. Oh. He said, if I subpoena your records, it's going to make life impossible for future historians. And I'm glad to have a public occasion to thank the dead Arthur Lyman for that gesture in favor of free speech. But he could have said I mean, that, was, that was the luck of the draw. If it had been somebody yeah. else, yeah. if it had been Kenneth Starr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I nearly got into trouble with Judge Walsh. Uh, at dinner Lawrence one Walsh. night with one of your colleagues, who I will not name, I said I was very fond of Cap Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense. And I said, I've had a lot of good interviews with Cap. The next day, some feds came around to my door in Capitol Hill. Huh? Mr. Morris, we believe you have records of conversations with the Defense Secretary, and we uh, wish to subpoena them. So I went down and was interviewed by Judge Walsh's um, hmm. guys for several hours, and it was quite scary. They were threatening to make a case of it and prosecute me if I did not give over my records. And I was rather hoping they would put me in jail because it would be great for future sales. <laughs> uh, but Judge Walsh backed down too. Ron? Or I think just to be the devil's advocate, I'll, because I do worry about a dearth, but it's also possible that we'll have a superabundance of evidence. And I've spent the last you know, 12 years um, uh, toiling in the vineyard of the 18th century where there are no photos, there are no newsreels, um, there were um, uh, newspapers and pamphlets, but newspapers had no spot news reporters, had no profiles, had no features, had no interviews. I can't tell you how this complicates life. I mean, when you think of how minutely um, the presidency is, is, is covered in virtually every conceivable form now, the president, as David was saying, immediately rushes out to write a memoir. Every single member of the cabinet and the White House staff rushes out mm -hmm. to publish um, a, 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 a memoir. One of the things you're looking for when you write about president, what was public opinion like? You suddenly have billions of people tweeting around the world 
every day telling you instantaneously yeah. what they think. And I think that we go through the day, we leave a trail of evidence that is at least potentially recorded, you know, whether it's emails. I find every time I'm in a Manhattan uh, office lobby, they take a photo of me, so your photo is being taken everywhere. I think the big question is um, whether these materials will be preserved, one, and two, um, whether we will have retrieval devices in order to, uh, you know, retrieve, let's say, emails that were... There's a gentleman, right, yes, with the two fingers up. Go ahead. Technology I just want to be able to get a couple more in. Yeah. But, yeah. Edmund, you wanted to say something? I just wanted to say technology keeps changing. All the records of the Reagan White House were recorded in an a IBM language called DisplayRide, yeah. which is now as extinct as um, Sanskrit. That's right. That's right. So God knows how many times yeah. the digital revolution is going to change what is now supposed to be a solid record. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, yeah, and if required. there are other questions, it's be better to line up at the mic. I mean, we only have time for probably two more after this, and we'll go with a little pace. Sir, it ties in what you finished off there with uh, in the vilification of, of, of the presidency, that once someone just not only announces the candidacy, but even before they announce the candidacy, they're, they're immersed in a, in a fishbowl, essentially. And then once they're in, every, every, you know, they're, everything is analyzed, every single syllable. Uh, my question is, uh, my, my, my feeling is, I'm going to tell me if you agree with it, because of this, uh, I always feel that the, the, the pool of candidates running for president has been diluted. And a lot of the, the really, truly qualified people who could really do an outstanding job of president are simply saying, why would I put myself through this? Because of the level of self-exposure and exposure. Right. And Mike, so if you agree with that, you know, can we solve? And also, do you think if that same issue existed back when TR was president or Jefferson was president? Back then, did we truly get the, you know, the cream of the population to run for president? Well, I think we president? can agree, we, at least to some measure, we got a, a certain, call it, cream, because cream is white, uh, uh, <laughs> of enlightenment philosopher types in, 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 in that first founding generation, can't we? But uh, Edmund, you want to answer that? If Theodore Roosevelt was running for the presidency today, um, with the scrutiny, the close-up scrutiny of cameras, he would come over so transcendentally weird <laughs> with his gnashing teeth and his high-pitched high grating voice and falsettos and his physical exuberance, which was so powerful. Too hot it, for TV. It, it, yeah, he would just come over as a wacko. It's, these days, it's cool characters like Reagan and Obama who come over on the box. But Clinton's pretty hot. Huh? Clinton's pretty hot personality, too, no? I don't know. I find it very contrived. <laughs> <laughs> was that a sigh or an answer? <laughs> Uh, in, in the interest of getting as many questions in as we can, why don't we do another one? Yes, you've had the opportunity to do both Obama and Clinton. I'm curious about your take on the actual truth of their relationship uh, currently and in the past. And also, <laughs> you commented that um, Clinton was an authentic phony. Yes. So I'm curious about the ubiquity of sociopathy and other psychopathology in the, in the Oval Office. <laughs> I was going to ask that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, David. Uh, well, um, there's uh, the, the relationship between Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Um, Bill Clinton was uh, called famously the first African American president, and Barack Obama really is. Um, and so, there, I mean, that, that shouldn't be taken lightly in terms of Bill Clinton's self image, is always, you know, the better part of his nature has always been how he's dealt with race. And that's the way he views himself idealistically. And so for Barack Obama to come along and sort of challenge that self-image uh, was part of, and also challenge his wife at the same time, created a lot of hostility, which was there clearly in 2008. Uh, and it even went back further than that to, to 2000 when, when Barack Obama ran for Congress in um, Chicago against Bobby Rush, the incumbent. And Bobby Rush had defended Clinton during the whole Lewinsky scandal and the impeachment and so on. Clinton came out and endorsed him in the primary against Obama. And, and so that was, that was the beginning of, and, and Rush won, uh, which was lucky for Obama in the end. But, but in any case, that was the beginning of that sort of uh, confrontation. Over the last four years, I mean, when Obama appointed Hillary to be Secretary of State, it was, uh, it was not only a brilliant calculation, but it helped... Um, and she became a great Secretary of State, but it also helped that relationship. It was actually Obama and Bill Clinton who wanted her to take the job, and she was reluctant to do it. Um, over the course of, 
of these four years gradually as President Obama has learned um, and seen that Bill Clinton is becoming more and more popular and learned how he was able to define his, his era and his record and the position of the Democratic Party better than Obama or anybody in his administration, he started to rely on him more and more. And so they started holding fundraisers a few months ago together. And then, of course, uh, Bill Clinton gave that uh, incredibly important speech at the Democratic Convention. Um, so right now, they're, I mean, they're, they're not best buddies. They never will be. Um, they're com very different types of people, and there's so many other uh, things fomenting uh, in their political lives. But they're together through this election uh, pretty tight. We have time for one more. Um, this gentleman, sir. Uh, people have said that the president's uh, biggest confidant and greatest advisor is their spouse, um, sometimes smarter than the president themselves. Uh, the, I'm curious as to what history has shown about this relationship uh, in the past, in the 20, early 20th century and the 19th century from your research. Well, I think we could probably answer, this is an especially loaded one for Annette, but let's, why don't we, <laughs> let, let's... <laughs> Let's start with Ron. I think everybody here could answer that question in one form or another, and then we'll call it a call Yeah, I don't know if Washington is a pretty good you know, example uh, for, uh, for this question. I think that Martha Washington certainly was an important confidant. Uh, she was extremely unhappy as uh, First Lady. In fact, she wrote a fascinating letter six months after becoming First Lady, although the term wasn't used yet. And she said, I feel uh, more like a prisoner of state than anything else. And she said, and since they did not allow me to do what I want, I stay home and do nothing. And she was constantly saying that she thought that some younger, more sociable woman would have uh, enjoyed the job more. I think that the role of, the, um, of, of, of the, uh, the, the first spouse is extremely important because the presidency is very, very um, isolating. In fact, I think the special problem, this administration, where um, there's a small uh, political Cleek, the David Pluffs, the David Axelrods, Valerie, uh, uh, Jarrett, uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's been a weakness of this administration, you know, in terms of not having um, access to more sources of opinion. And so I think that what happens in that bubble that is the the presidency, and this has only gotten uh, worse. I think that uh, the uh, president's uh, wife, and perhaps someday the president's husband, you know, will be that source of kind of you know unvarnished truth-telling that the president's not getting from his advisors. It, it, let's go in order of presidents. Annette? Uh, well, Jefferson's wife, legal wife, died um, before he, you know, years before he became president, 1782, and she's president, um, 1800. So his, I, I suppose she may have been someone who was supportive of him when he was governor of Virginia. She, when he was a elected or chosen to be governor, she did not want to go to uh, the Capitol with him. You get a sense of being someone who preferred to be at home and was not a part of his life. Um, so he was not married when he was president. His daughter served as, his daughter Martha came and served sometime as um, the first lady. Dolly Madison played the role a couple of times and there, was, there were whispers about that, uh, you know, Dolly Madison being his first lady. I mean, of course, Sally Hemings was not a wife and was not as far as we know, in Washington, she could well have been. There are some indications that she may have been. But the story about Sally Hemings broke when he was president. And so there was very much scrutiny, on, a lot of scrutiny on his private life. And as a matter of fact, he didn't take, he took no enslaved people to work, you know, at the, at the White House. At, uh, it wasn't called the White House, the president's house. But he hired people there. So he's very... As president, he's very, he's using his daughters more as people who are, you know, the public face of the first family, as it wasn't called that then. But there's no reason to suppose that she had any, or he would have had any kind of, uh, uh, she would have had any kind of role in his, his, his ideas about policy or anything like that. David, you, you've got one of your subjects, the spouse may end up being president of the United right. States herself. <laughs> uh, in a number of years from now. Um, how would you go about this question? Well, I think that Hillary Clinton is probably, I don't, I'm not an expert on Wilson and his wife, but I, I, I think that, that Hillary Clinton is the most political uh, first lady in history just by the nature of what she's done since mm -hmm. and what she did in the White House. And she and Bill Clinton, from the moment they met at Yale Law School, 
saw it as a political partnership um, and a pretty deep one. And, uh, you know, she helped him get where he had to go. She was instrumental uh, in throughout his governorship in Arkansas and running most of the major uh, programs, thematic programs on education and welfare reform and other things that, that helped him become president. Um, and then he just assumed that she was his best partner in, in his political life when he got to the White House and appointed her head of health care. And that, in some degrees, backfired for a lot of different reasons, not just her. Um, but they, they have this yin-yang relationship when, when one's up, the other's down. Um, but, but they always need that, that balance. Mm -hmm. So when Bill Clinton was in trouble, Hillary saved him, you know. And when she was getting, uh, almost got indicted during the administration, which people forget, uh, his popularity rose during that period. And, and he, he sort of was buoyed by helping her out. Mm. Um, and so uh, it's complete opposite of the Obamas. Uh, Michelle Obama, to me, is the inevitable end of the arc of Barack Obama's search for home, uh, which he never really had until he got to Chicago mm -hmm. and found her. Um, and so on a personal level, it's incredibly important. She does, as, as Ron mentioned, represent a little bit of that Chicago clique, which is fairly narrow and confined, and, and Valerie Jarrett is largely there because she's such a great friend of Michelle's and, and like a big sister to Barack. Um, so, but Michelle is, is serving that purpose of being more popular than the president, which is important, and she really has not taken on any controversial issues at all, unlike Hillary. I, I hate for this to end, but end it must, and I am deeply grateful to all four of you. Thank you. John Turner, Bernard, David Marin, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.